Welcome to As I Live and Grieve, a podcast that tells the truth about how hard this is. We're glad you joined us today. We know how hard it is to lose someone you love and how well-intentioned friends and family try so hard to comfort us. We created this podcast to provide you with comfort, knowledge, and support. We are grief advocates, not professionals, not licensed therapists. We are you. Today we are speaking with Hermes Auslander. Hermes describes himself as an alien just visiting Earth for a while and maybe decorating the place with some artwork while here. Successfully infiltrated and currently undercover in the U.S. military, creator of the Scuttlebutt podcast, artist of countless canvases, but biographer not. Welcome back, everyone, to As I Live and Grieve. Today, we are so excited to have with us Hermes Auslander, who is going to talk with us today about coping mechanisms, some that work and some that don't, from his own personal experiences. Before we actually get started with that, though, Hermes, would you tell our listeners a little bit about yourself? Sure. Gosh, where do we start? Uh, I'm currently an active duty uh, military member. I previously um, had, uh, I, I would just say a military, I'll just sum it up to a military brat's lifestyle. So moved around a lot, traveled a lot, met a lot of people and had my fair share of instances of grief. And I, I think that's how we connected and, and why I was interested in maybe coming on the show. Perfect. Well, we're so glad you did. I'm glad you reached out. Um, and I can't wait to hear what you have to say. I always love to hear people's stories. And you sound to me like you're going to have some really interesting stories to tell us. <laughs> I did not realize that you were military. So thank you for serving. Appreciate the support. My husband, who died uh, three and a half years ago, was retired Army. I don't know uh, which branch you're in, and it really doesn't matter. But at any rate, thank you so much for doing that. Now. On the topic of grief and coping mechanisms, we all know that each one of us is entirely different. Some of us can cope. Some of us can't. Some of us learn about different methods of coping from various resources. So did you have any professional help? Uh, I would say no, not, okay. not professional. I've talked to professionals uh, outside of the professional um uh, arena, but never official. No. Okay. All right. So what types of grief have you encountered in your life? <sighs> Loss is a big one. Uh, both friends, family, and loved ones, I guess you could say. Okay. Is that through death, you mean? Death and uh, no longer in my life personally. Okay. All right. So whether it's death or even like divorce or just parting of ways or whatever, um, we have established with many of our guests and listeners that you can grieve that it doesn't necessarily have to be related to death. So give us the first example, if you would, please. How about a coping mechanism that did not work for you? Did not work for me would be substance abuse. That was, a, I feel like a, it's a cliche and one that often is spoken about. And I think it's just because it's a very accessible one. And it certainly was for me. Okay. And how did you eventually, did you eventually resolve that? I did. I, I have thus far. Uh, I, uh, I would, I, a lot of, a lot of uh, individuals will say, yeah, I'm two years, 10 years, 20 years sober. Uh, it's, uh, my story is a little bit more or less complicated than that. It's, I'm not necessarily that I just gave up substance abuse in general. I just um, chose my substances more wisely, I would say, and then I chose a healthier lifestyle to live and uh, and not use it as the coping mechanism per se. Okay. Can you give us any more details about that? When I uh, so the are we getting into our first our first uh, bout of grief because wherever uh, my, you would like to go. Sure. Uh, my first uh, bout of grief was with a friend of mine who um, committed suicide, okay. uh, took his own life, and. And uh, he and I, it's always a, uh, it's always weird to classify because it's always one of those things where you look back on, where you look back on a situation, and because it's through new eyes or it's in hindsight, you look at it slightly differently. And it's one of those where, you know, we 
we hung out, we drank and we, you know, had laughs and it was all fine at the time. And then, re- you know, retroactively looking back, it's like, well, maybe that was his coping mechanism. And I sort of picked up a lot of those habits, mm-hmm. you know, based on that relationship. And therefore, through the habits that I established with him after his after his passing, it was one of those things that it just seemed natural to continue along those those paths. And alcohol was a big one where and alcohol and and uh, cannabis actually, along with a couple other substances as well, just I would say party drugs, you know, whenever I could absence myself from from a, a state of mind, that's what I was all about. But alcohol and cannabis were big ones. And yeah, using those uh, as crutches, I would guess, through day to day life, and then using um, large events or large party drugs as uh, escapes were were the big ones, I guess, for myself. And then, yeah, figuring out why and where all that came from was sure. was part of that process. Sure. And and when you kind of resolved that, did you turn to another coping mechanism? Yeah, uh, a couple actually. Uh, again, deciding that a healthier lifestyle was a preferred lifestyle for myself. Exercise was a big one. Uh, and then time management, just just organizing my life as to what I wanted in it and what and how I wanted to fill it. Uh, a big one for me uh, was art. I've always been an artist. I've always drawn. I've always painted. I've always written since, you know, since I could remember. I remember mm-hmm. one of the very first ones I ever, uh, drawings I ever did was, I was like four years old. And therefore, that was always like a a very big uh, solace of mine to just uh, an escape of mine that I didn't really accept at the time when I was dealing with all that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know I visited your website and I saw some of your art. I liked it very much, although I will say to me, it has a very intense, slightly dark tone. Well, maybe slightly dark is an understatement with some, but (laughs) but it is very intense. Do you think some of that is a is a holdover is still part of your your grief coming to the surface? Uh absolutely. And I I I do hope so. Uh in a lot of ways because of uh a lot of the a lot of the emotions, a lot of the inspiration for some of those pieces of therapy I would call them, you know. Right. I you know, I I was certainly trying to deal with a lot of uh a lot of thoughts and a lot of emotion, a lot of feelings, a lot of situational um mm-hmm. Uh, circumstance that I found art to be helpful with in processing a lot of that. So I, yeah, I, I would certainly hope that that is what was conveyed and ultimately registered with an audience member. So okay. thank you. <laughs> Do you <laughs> that's okay. Um, yeah, I want, I'd like to see more actually. I think you should post more on your website. Do you sell any of your art? Do you do anything commercial with it? Or is it pretty much just a, well, I, I even hate to use the word hobby because it's, to me, it's beyond hobby level. But do you do anything commercially with it? I do. I there are uh, there are avenues on the website, uh, just personally that I've, you know, commission work and uh, yeah, on the website, any of my personal pieces are available okay. as well for for sale. Okay. It's weird to think about that, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know. What do you find is your inspiration at times? <laughs> uh, it, it's funny. Uh, I've I've talked about a uh, a couple inspirations being less than ideal I guess or as you would might say classify as dark mm-hmm. uh more more than anything going back to that I guess um narr- or description that you had of dark uh, or intense rather is mm-hmm. uh anything that hits me intensely immediately makes it to page for some reason yeah. it's just one of those things if whether it's happier or less than happy I would guess classically or statistically speaking if you look at my work it's usually less than happy but it's it's just the intensity yeah if it if it hits me on an intense level it hits that chord that's usually what makes the paper yeah and you know whether it's odd or not sometimes i find that those pieces which someone may look at and say oh my gosh that's so dark i don't like that <laughs> maybe dark for that person but for someone else it may actually be a source of comfort because it may let them know that they're not alone, that somebody else shares this intense feeling that they do. So I never like to rule something out and just say, oh, it's dark. It's not good. To me, many of those pieces actually, and I, I don't know, Stephanie, would you agree that there there can be a lot of beauty to some of those dark pieces? 
Yeah, I think it's, you know, certain things can, like, I'm scrolling through right now looking at, at some of your art. <laughs> I and, thought you might and, be. <laughs> and it's just, you know, you scroll by and then all of a sudden something will just kind of hit you. You're like, oh, it's just, yeah. So something triggers, I think, which is similar to grief. We all grieve in different ways. Um, so, yeah, art is going to be accepted, I think, in a different way to each person, too. It's going to give them a different, you know, remembrance or trigger of something yeah yeah and and do you find that when you draw or when you create your art would you say that that's a coping mechanism that works for you uh thus far uh i would say okay. so it has right. yeah. yeah i can't think of anything that would put you in danger from drawing unless it would be <laughs> right maybe getting punctured by a pencil or something. <laughs> you know? but, Insomnia maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I would definitely say continue with the art. I would love to see more. Thank you. Okay. So how about another coping mechanism, good or bad? I'll let you choose this time. Uh, well, <laughs> we're down the art road. So let's hit the other side of duality, right? Uh, okay. The not so, the not so great, uh, I would generalize this as just a repression, I would guess. Uh, one one coping mechanism that was and is very prevalent in my family and my social circles is that of repression. It's uh it's not uh it's not something we're dealing with, it's not something we're going to bring to the surface. So right. let's push it into the smallest area we can and not have to look at it, type of deal. That's okay. certainly a big one for myself. Yeah, and usually when you repress, at some point it uh, comes out sometimes right. in a not so good way. Have you had any experience with that happening? I did when I was younger. Okay. I would say, yeah, uh, uh, regretfully so, or you know, looking back on it, regretfully so. But you know, we we all have to grow somehow, and yeah, that was one of those. Okay. Now, the looking back in hindsight, one of those that I have, right. I hope, learned from and grown from. Right. From what I know of the military, and I know pieces here and there, the basic training is very, very intense. And I, you know, I'm sure it's no different today than it was um, back in the 60s. Well, it's probably different in some ways. Do you find that any of the skills, I'll call it, that you learned in the military help you repress? Uh, funny, funny you bring that up is... Uh... I've I've heard uh I've had two different types of conversations with regard to this and one side of it is that the basic training is intended to be intense yes. and is intended to break a lot of people and I've and I would say at least half of the people if not more um I gosh would we start with 100, 100 plus people and we graduated mm -hmm. with 40 yeah uh so what is that 60% will break yes having said that the opposite side is maybe having the upbringing I did, it wasn't a big deal for myself. And one, one individual I actually spoke to about it was saying, uh, jokingly, but also, you know, ironically said, uh, well, maybe that's because you were already picked up before you got there. <laughs> and, uh, Possible. <laughs> and it's one way to look at it. Yeah. <laughs> Certainly one way to look at it. And to go to answer your question of repression, does, what skills did it necessarily teach me? Again, going back to Maybe I was already taught those skills growing up. Okay. I would say more than anything, it just reinforced them for me. I, I immediately got into um, the community of the military and just was right at home. It was already what I was used to. And the only, you know, again, the only change or thing I could uh, talk about in regards to that is that it just reinforced like, you know, you, you have the uniform and when you're in the uniform, you're expected to present this right. specific face and right. that is the face you present. So okay. it just reinforced that idea, I guess. Okay. So then for you, is your repression a coping mechanism that does work for you or does not work for you? It certainly doesn't. I, uh, I try as, as, as best as I can to not repress anymore. And that's where the art comes from for sure is I, okay have to repress by and large when you're in uniform because it's considered an unprofessional uh yes and i and i think that's to some degree a good thing uh it is considered an unprofessional situation to bring your personal into the work so definitely your military service is connected to your repression then in some form mm -hmm. 
Yeah, certainly. Uh, again, for me personally, just speaking personally, yes. it was certainly a reinforcement. And again, uh, I don't disagree with some of the reinforcement of it, but that's where I feel that I'm lucky in that I have a lot of creative outlets that I've found to be helpful in okay. my artwork, in my writing, in even uh, you know my podcasting, in discussing topics like this and getting to talk about it on another's uh, podcast like your guys' mm -hmm. podcast here. So. Yeah, well, you know, that's one of the reasons we started this podcast. We would like to make grief and death in general a, a more comfortable topic for discussion because we think that is going to do a lot to help some people grieve and uh, actually as a coping mechanism, you know. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we appreciate you your willingness to step in and, and help out with that as well. Now, you just mentioned writing in a bit. What is it you write? <laughs> uh, I, I've journaled. Again, okay. probably as long as I have uh, drawn mm -hmm. and I've I produced like small thing, you know, essays throughout school okay. and um, I've, I've worked on a novel for, gosh, probably a decade now that I still have yet to publish. <laughs> uh, I'm, su I'm super self-critical when it comes to my writing. It can, every time I review it, it's never right. So uh, it is yeah. yet, it is yet to come out a lot. I've done blogs. I've done, you know, little snippets of of this and that here and their poetry I dabbled in for a while, but uh, by and large, it's more of just a personal therapy right now. It has right. never, it has never as, as, um, as much as the artwork has been publicized. Right. Yeah. I, I understand that completely. I also am a writer though at this time I'm not journaling at all for some reason. I don't know why. Maybe it's because I'm switching to the podcast and telling my tales instead. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Are there other forms of the arts? What about music? Is music an outlet for you? Does that help you at all cope? Uh, it, I'm not a musician by any stretch of the imagination, <laughs> and I certainly would never profess that I could ever potentially be one. <laughs> I do appreciate uh, music. And I love it. It is a, a integral part, I would say, of even my artwork in that I always have it playing. I'm okay. very fond of vast, uh, you know, a, a varied uh very degree of genres out there. I, yeah, I, I absolutely adore music. It is very, very important to me, especially in an emotional sense, uh, mm -hmm. in connection wise. Uh, but I don't, I, yeah, I don't produce any. <laughs> okay. But even though you may not be a musician, uh, listening to the music, do you find it helps you cope with grief? Cer certainly in, in terms of the artwork. I, I couldn't, I have never produced a piece of art, a piece, okay. anything at all without music playing. I can't right. imagine doing so. All right. And are there different genres you listen to for different moods? For example, if you want to kind of stabilize, maybe you've had a hectic or a chaotic day or something has gone wrong or whatever. Do you find you listen to a particular genre to get some relief? <laughs> yes and no. Yes, I do match, I would say, okay. the mood at times. But I also, uh, I would... I would describe it as like a flow, I guess you would say, in that there, you know, one morning uh, a folk, you know, like a folk song will will resonate with me that day. Mm -hmm. And then I'll just follow that folk down the rabbit hole for that entire day. And my artwork not necessarily is reflective of that all the time, okay. may, maybe piece wise, but yeah. I'll just follow that for as long as it goes. And sometimes it's a day, sometimes it's a week or a month. Um, okay. But I certainly have a extremely varied genre. Anybody who's seen my playlist knows it's extremely varied. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. And with all the losses you've had in your life, what would you consider your greatest loss? Oh, I've, I've uh, recently been thinking about this uh, specific question over the last couple weeks, uh, both in preparation of this uh, show and with a couple of conversations I've had in my personal life and it's actually not a loss of, of life. I, the, uh, the individual I lost or individuals I lost are still alive to the best of my uh, knowledge. Mm -hmm. And it was actually, um, it's actually, uh, an ex of mine and, uh, her daughter who for the time that we were together, right. a considerable amount of time, uh, I would consider my daughter, uh, unfortunately, no longer in my life, though. So that that would be what I would consider one of the hardest losses that I've experienced. I've, again, I've experienced death throughout my life, and I feel like maybe that's why 
I have the specific outlook of death that I have and that it's not or hasn't been in hind- gosh, it's in, ret- in comparison mm-hmm. as impactful as that one. But that one certainly has been the most impactful in my right. in my life. And something like that can be just as devastating um, to some people as a death would be. Uh, sometimes, however, they do tend to resolve in years that come later. Uh, for example, I'm not sure how old the daughter is, but she may, if she really is close to you, she may at some point try to seek you out as well. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that I'm not saying that that is going to happen. I'm not a psychic by any means, but um, <laughs> you never know with something mm-hmm. like that. Certainly. But for this loss, I certainly can appreciate and respect that this is very devastating. And I actually hear it many, many times, especially with people in the military, that uh, many, many go through that and it can be horribly devastating to them. So, um, I I understand that that loss. Is there something in particular you're doing to cope with this? I've uh I have quite a few pieces and and pieces of writing and pieces of uh artwork okay. that I've uh used as that as that big coping. I've more than uh gosh, to cope with it more than anything, yeah, has has been a combination of of my own personal artwork and self-reflection and inward like I, yeah inward reflection and and then and then a combination of of speaking about it for the for the longest time i didn't acknowledge that it was a thing i did i i said i was moving on it was you know it was a past relationship you know just chalk it up to what it was a little and, repression uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh you got me kathy <laughs> I, I know i know you made it so easy um uh, so it seems to me that your art and your writing are probably your favored coping mechanisms at this time. Would that be accurate? Healthy wise, yes. I, I exercise quite a bit as well. And when okay. I first uh, experienced a lot of these griefs, it was exercise that I uh, dove into first. It was the okay. first and easiest thing to to get all of right. the emotion out. Right. You know, work out five, six hours a day. You think five, six hours less of grief that's that's a lot of exercise (laughs) i'm I'm almost in awe (laughs) no it's not i i would have thought your military training might have been more responsible for that (laughs) but um so that was a coping mechanism does that work for you the exercise uh yeah in balance it does like i said uh when i when i first experienced uh uh the loss of of the relationship and my yeah. daughter, uh, it was, uh, it was, it was extreme where it was, you wake up, uh, I would exercise for two hours. I would, um, I would go, you know, uh, meet with, you know, at the time I was unemployed. So I would go out job hunting. I would meet with, you mm-hmm. know, employer, I would, um, you know, do something like that. And then that would spend, you know, two, three hours, four hours at most. And then I'd go back and exercise for another two hours. And then I would also start with the, uh, intoxicant drinking and, you know, um, you know, um, ca- like a communal, you know, what would you call it? Like interaction, you know, go out with yeah. friends and right. hang out with the bars and things like that for an additional four or five hours. And then I would exercise again before I went to sleep uh-huh. and that would just fill the day. And that's what I would do every day for six okay. months, roughly. Okay. It, it seems to me there is almost a, um, I guess I'll call it a duality in the exercise as a coping mechanism because it helps you, but it helps you repress. Mm. So is it good or is it bad? Positive or negative? At that time, I would say it was, it was kind of (laughs) speaking. (laughs) I like that, Kathy. I like that. Uh, (laughs) uh, In terms of the repression, it was certainly mostly negative in that it it was assisting in the repression. It was assisting in the neglect of, you know, accepting and dealing with and actually healthily coping with a, with an issue. Uh, Now I I use it more as a natural stress relief, a natural endorphin, Mm -hmm. um, you know, substance. And, you know, it, it fills a part of my day and starts out a healthy mindset, I guess, of clearing the mind, sweating it out, et cetera. 
yeah. and uh, and not overdoing it. And then I guess not having that negative aspect of it and using it as a repressive technique or substance uh, didn't allow me to have the healthy dynamic I have or, you know, relationship I have with it now. So understood, understood. It was kind of healthy in that respect <laughs> that I learned <laughs> that it worked ish. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Um, I wanted to go back to your, your coping mechanism of time management. Do you still do that to this day? Is that still a coping mechanism you use? Absolutely. Do you yeah. use it daily to keep you on track kind of? Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. It's, uh, I, I, it's one of those things that I feel like at this point, it's almost become second nature, mm -hmm. but voicing it and thinking about it, you know, now it would be, yeah, it's certainly yeah. one of those things that takes time to process and takes time to plan and helps with the whole rhythm and habit mm -hmm. of, of a healthy lifestyle versus an unhealthy repressed, uh, you know, toxic and filled right. type of lifestyle. I guess it's funny because I, I wouldn't, um, I guess I, I would, I thought of time management as my coping skill for my anxiety. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I guess, how do you, I know that myself when I, cause I keep a calendar and I keep, I keep a couple of them because I'm, I'm just anal <laughs> like that. But if, what, what do you do then? Or how does it feel to you when maybe cause life happens, something, you know, has to jump in and you you can't keep on your schedule for the day. Uh, so I would, I would say two things that I, I'm with you with the anxiety. It helps with the anxiety part <laughs> yeah. of thinking ahead and, and overthinking things a lot of times. Mm -hmm. So when something does come up that throws throws me for a loop, mm -hmm. it's a moment of anxiety. Right. But because I have that rhythm, I know, okay, this is what I need to do now to handle this and to fit it into the rhythm and therefore continue the flow. And then that gives me a sense of relief so of like, okay, I know what to do. <laughs> exactly. I, I know what to do. I know what needs to happen. Right. If it's a day, a week or whatever, then I have to do this, this and this. And then I have the rhythm again and I'll have the and all of it's part of the rhythm. So mm -hmm. it's a it's a moment of anxiety, but only because I but, or, but only because it's not the normal flow I have. Right. And other than that, it helps with the flow. But the but the second part, I would say, is that it um uh, how, like how to articulate this part, because it's more of the, like the feeling, I guess, of it is is uh. Uh, I, so like I also edit the podcast, so I know like the mindset it takes, I guess, or like, um, the personality it takes to find the rhythm or the joy in, in that part of, of creativity. And my artwork is the same way. It's like every detail, everything. So more than, I guess more than anything, it's like, um, why it would help as a coping is that it's a, an assurance, I guess, yeah. more than anything else. It's like, I, one thing that caused a lot of anxiety was the was the grief and and it was a sudden moment of uncertainty mm -hmm. and shock and you know all of the above and so to develop something for myself a tool i guess of myself that helps with that and alleviate some of that was was something looking back on now is like wow that really did help with mm -hmm. the grief it really did help me put me uh, put me in a mindset to deal with what i needed to deal with cuz i knew you know, an hour a day, you know, 45 minutes every morning, you need to meditate, you need to process that you need a clear thought, you need to do these things. And that's been hugely beneficial to, to my grief and to, to pr processing grief. Mm -hmm. So that's how I would, I guess, articulate yeah. it. I guess I, I just never thought of my, I thought of uh, my time management. I thought that was just something, it was just me because I have to have control over this, 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 <laughs> but I guess that's huh? I, when you were talking about it, I guess that's my my way of knowing what to expect for the day to it's some things that I can control because I, my mom always tells me this stuff, like, don't worry about that because you can't control it. If it's something you can change, then fine, change it. If you can't, you got to let it go. So I think yeah. that that, and, and I've been really good the last year at, at doing that and going, okay, I can't stress about this because I can't control it. Move on, go on to the next thing. And I think mm -hmm. just organizing my, my day and things I have to do. Yeah. That's all I, you know what you can, right, you know, right. what you I can, can organize yeah. it. So, but yeah, I guess I didn't yeah. think of it. I don't know why I didn't think of it as a coping mechanism. <laughs> I don't know. Well, sometimes training ourselves is the hardest job we'll ever do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, 
it's one thing to tell somebody else, but to, to do it right. yourself is different. I commend you for finding these coping mechanisms on your own without professional help. I'm not the type of person that will seek out professional help on the regular. Like I'm, I'm not that person that's going to go talk to a, a psychiatrist or no, it's not me. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I'm going to do the research. I'm going to try this coping mechanism. Did it work? No. Okay. On to the next one. And that's, you know, that's next. So I commend you for doing that without professional help and realizing and finding in yourself what, what you need to do. Well, appreciate it. I, I'm curious. Did you ever take a tip or or advice or something from an outside source and use it as as a coping mechanism or as a um, tool into your process of coping? Well, what my mother has always told me: if you can't change it, then let it go. Okay. Um, <laughs> and I hate that stupid song. And from because I have boys, so I don't have girls, so I never saw that movie that has the "Let It Go" song. You know, oh, yes, frozen. Frozen. <laughs> See, I don't have girls. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just one of those stupid things that I just kind of like, you know, I'll sing. I hate the song, first of all. So <laughs> I just kind of play it in my head really quick. And then I'm just, you know, try to smile and carry on and go on to the next thing. And, but I mean, my things too, is like listening to music. I by no means am a musician. I can't sing for anything. But being in my car or sitting at my desk and playing whatever music is, is hitting me for that mood at the time. That is how I release too. That's my, mm -hmm. you know, so that's, I don't, did I answer the question? I don't even know what the question was. Some overlap. <laughs> yeah, you did. You did. You took, you took, you took a little bit of uh, your mom's uh, advice and yeah. decided to figure out how to put it into yeah. Whether it's music right. or whether it's a reference, and or I'm, I'm also an, a big one for like inspirational quotes, um, and I see them all over the place on Facebook. But I just like that's usually what my my desktop wallpaper is, and mm -hmm. you know, just because I I'll constantly see it, and it just it hits me, and I just so that's my. Are you a reader? Is why? Uh, yes, but I don't have the time <laughs> to do it. <laughs> like I literally, I'll have my Kindle propped up on the sink as I get ready every morning and I maybe get in five minutes of reading. <laughs> that's it. Uh, that's better than zero. I know. I know. <laughs> and I really should like take it with me. And when I'm waiting for the kids, yeah. read a little bit, but I should, I need to work it. I have to work it into my time management, my calendar for the day. There you go. <laughs> We're all working on ourselves. Yes. Uh, even I am still working on myself, although I'm you know, getting a little better at it, I think I should by this time. Before we go, our time is running short, but before we go, I want to offer you the time to speak directly to our audience. Tell them about your website. Tell them about your podcast. Tell them about anything you would like them to hear from you without us offering questions and leading the way. <laughs> <laughs> uh well thank you Kathy I uh, appreciate that uh my so I I do have a podcast uh as a it's called the Scuttlebutt podcast it's one I do with my friends it actually started out of the idea that military doesn't always have the platform to talk about things that matter mm -hmm. to them and it, specifically things that they're technically not supposed to talk about all the time <laughs> now <laughs> we get goofy sometimes we talk about a plethora of topics, you know, big to small, but a big thing we promote is mental health uh, and, and things that, that are important to mental health regarding the military. So that's, that's one place that people can connect and listen. And that would be awesome. We're, we're still building the audience. We're still building the narrative. We're still building our voices, but mm -hmm. that's one that we are very passionate about myself personally. Yeah. Is my, is my website, uh, Hermes It's uh, it has everything. It has the podcast there. It has a lot of the pieces I do, some of the blogs, uh, some of the forums that I've engaged in, all of that stuff. Uh, it took a long time. It doesn't look great, but it's my <laughs> website that I put together. And uh, yeah, it has, uh, it has a lot of that stuff out there. Another one are, is like uh, Art Pal. It's one of the very first galleries I ever set up when I was way back in high school. And I started uploading you know, just various pieces that I had done, both digital and physical. And uh, those are those are the big ones for myself. If you want to connect with me, uh, social media as well. I'm very open. If you want to message me, as Kathy and I have have discussed uh, over Facebook uh, private messaging, uh, I have pages. I have Twitter. I have uh, Instagram. I think I have I have all of those. Uh, if you if you message me there, a notification will pop up eventually, 
and I'll answer it. So any of those, hermesauslander.com. Yes, I have already added you to the eclectic side of my network. I want you to know. Um, <laughs> you are not part of the routine network. You're part of the eclectic. So um, because I think, I think you and I could discuss some issues that are very unique and maybe deeper than other people would like to delve at, at times. And maybe at some point we'll get a chance to do just that. Wonderful. We, if, for our listeners, again, thank you. We're going to post on our website in the episode notes ways you can contact Hermes. And I hope you do. He's fascinating to talk with. Just the little fragments he and I have exchanged here and there. Uh, I found myself very intrigued by him <laughs> as a person. And I still don't feel I know him very well. <laughs> he has helped us today learn how coping mechanisms, for me, it's, it's almost a cycle. You find one, you try it, maybe it doesn't work. So you kind of give up on that, take care of yourself a little bit to maybe repair any damage that might have done, and you move on to another one. Eventually, you find one that works. Now, maybe it works in some ways, but really doesn't work in other ways. Still okay, because as you go forward, you simply have to try the best you can to take care of yourself. And maybe what your body and your mind are telling you is that you still need to repress this portion of it for now. But at some point, that portion is going to come to the surface and you are either going to use the same coping mechanism or move on again. So for me, today's conversation has been very insightful about coping mechanisms. It's not cut and dried. It's not black and white. It's very gray. And like grief, it's different for every single person. So that's it for today. Look for this podcast and look for others like it. We've got more guests coming along. Pass it on to your friends as well. Take care of yourself as we all continue to live in grief. Thank you so much for listening with us today. Do you have a topic that you'd like us to cover or do you have a question from one of our episodes? Please email us at info at asiliveandgrieve.com and let us know. We hope you will find a moment to leave a review, send an email, and share with others. Join us next time as we continue to live and grieve together.